Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Hello, I'm Beth Parker, and I'm glad that you're joining us for Ethical Perspectives. About six years ago, my terminally ill mother came to live with me, and she passed, transitioned in my home. From my perspective, she passed peacefully. However, had I known then what I know now, things could have been very different. It's time to meet our distinguished panelists. So, Billy, Mary Kay, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves and say a little bit about why this is such important work. Billy, you want to start? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Billy Jennings. I'm an RN with a BSN in South Louisiana. Um, for the last 20 years, I've owned and operated an assisted living facility um, and participated in transitioning my um, residents in long-term care into um, a plan for end of life. Mary Kay. Hi. I have been doing end of life care for my entire career. Um, started as a hospice chaplain, um, was the first chaplain for Iowa City Hospice here in Iowa. And then in 2005, became the chaplain for palliative care at university hospitals here in Iowa City. So currently I am a certified death doula and am working at the Birdhouse, which is our local hospice um, facility. Thank you. I recent, I mentioned that I recently learned of a workbook. It's, it's entitled Living Fully and Dying Well. What is that about? What's the whole concept of dying well? What is that about? Well, I know on the front end of life, um, it's common for a mother to prepare a birth plan. Um, and as we know, um, that often may not go to plan um, um, because it's hard to control that natural process. And I think a big part of dying well is um, being able to have a personal plan that you can share with your loved ones and work together through um, so that your death can be what you want it to be, ultimately. Yes, I have to say in the hospital, in my many years of work there, it is tragic how many people do not die well. And so I have become passionate about helping people to do just that. Um, too often I have seen the disconnect between healthcare professionals and families who are grieving. So there will be a crisis that brings uh, a loved one to the hospital, often in the ICU or the emergency room. And you get these two entities together, the family and the medical professionals. And unfortunately, the medical professionals start speaking medicalese and they understand what they're talking about, but you can watch the family slowly their eyes glaze over because they're confused. They don't know what questions to ask and they're grieving. So we have this horrible disconnect. And at times, one of the worst things you wanna hear is a family member say, just do everything because they're at a loss to know how to differentiate what's better, what's, um, what would my loved one want? And when you ask that question, what would your loved one want? Often they say, I have no idea. We have never talked about this because we live in a death phobic society. So it, for some people, it's impolite to talk about dying. Um, I've had people say, oh, my mother, when I bring it up to try and know what she wants, she says, don't you dare talk about that. So there's this societal norm to not talk about it, which sets people up for horrible end of life care. So as Americans, you know, how do we view or how do we engage the traumatic transition, the dying process? Um, in other cultures, we're, we're aware of the celebrations in the Hispanic communities yeah. of Day of the Dead. But in America, we defy death um, under all circumstances. And I just for context, I want to quote from an article um, from the New York Times. It's an older article and it was written by a medical professional. Um, he writes, a decade ago as a doctor in the intensive care unit uh, at the University of Medicine of, and Dentistry of New, New, of New Jersey in Newark, I met Vincent. 
He writes, in trying to answer, in trying to honor Vincent's autonomy, we abandon him in hell. He was a quote, frequent flyer, unquote, back and forth between the ICU and his nursing home down the street. By the time I met him, Vincent was no longer really with us. The only signs of life occurred during dressing changes and bed turning. When despite extra pain medication, pain fired up the dormant neurons and his blue eyes flared. Vincent's directive was typical for that of a patient from a nursing home, but it was a piece of paper, a notebook paper double stamped to his directive that caught my attention. He, Vincent himself had written these words, quote, to any doctor who will take care of me in the future, it read, I want you to do everything you possibly can in your power to keep me alive as long as you possibly can, end quote. So uh, the doctor goes on to speak in very visceral terms about the physical decline of Vincent. He says, in our well-meaning attempts to keep our patients alive, we, ICU physicians, often play whack-a-mole with illness, batting down each problem as it surfaces, all in the name of patient autonomy. Doctors became medical vending machines. Our treatments laid out behind a piece of glass. Just press E6, we'll get started and go on forever. <clears throat> he talks again about Vincent's decline. And he says that the man's body was being eaten to a degree I had, I had never seen. Um, I am sure that Vincent could not have known what he was setting himself up right. for. We could keep his body going while it was trying its hardest to die. Let's pull all that together. Your comments, your thoughts. Um, one thing that I definitely experience that is often asked on admission into long-term care facilities um, is if you want to be a DNR or if you want to, us to resuscitate you, should we find you in a state where your heart isn't beating and you're not breathing? DNR. And, and for one, a DNR. Right. DNR. So for, do not resuscitate. Thank DNR. You. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lack of knowledge on the state an elderly person with chronic illness is likely to be resuscitated too, which right. puts us in these long-term, low quality of life um, states. Um, another experience that I have, especially coming from the South, is the just general idea of the protection of life itself. On the front end, the big, a big right to, light, to life movement exists here. And it would often just creep up in the back end as well, where even with comfort meds, end of life, doctor ordered pain medications, um, we would have families not wanting us to actually give them, feeling as though they are killing their own parent. Mm. And so those, those were two big areas in my experience where there was a lack of education um, for the family members to um, kind of bridge the gap that allows you to um, embrace the natural process that is happening. Yeah, I mean, that's a classic case. And what I would say Vincent needed was a good chaplain conversation. You know, was there fear around his dying? Um, and I would say those doctors need a good chaplain as well because they have taken a Hippocratic oath to do no harm. And there comes a time when physicians are causing harm for the sake of doing everything. So to me, that, that um, directive that he wrote should have had much more conversation about it. And I agree with you, Billy, too often the way CPR conversations go is if your heart stops, do you want us to start it again? And which is totally coercive. And only 10% of people actually get back to the place they were um, before a witnessed code. So we're starting with really bad statistics, but the lay person does not know this. And unless we begin to educate and unless physicians and healthcare workers begin to be willing to bridge that gap I was talking about, we are going to get more and more Vincents because 
we can keep bodies alive. We can keep bodies alive that have absolutely no quality of life. So the question becomes, what is quality of life? And Mary Kay, how does the <clears throat> how does the doula, the death doula profession enter in that? Billy and I have talked about that. We've talked about it. It seems to be something that people are looking at. As a, death, yeah. as a certified death doula, share a little information about how yeah. death doulas can help this process. So we are part of what's called the death positive movement. And that is, as you might guess, trying to move death into the forefront so that there can be open conversations about what people want. So a death doula, one of our um, most important roles is to ask a person in preparing for the end of their life, who do you want to speak for you? And I always say, it's the conversation that matters. The paperwork can come later, but the conversation is what's most important. So who do you want to be your decision maker? And it needs to be someone who can honor your wishes without their own emotions getting in the way um, and truly do what you have said you want to be done. Um, and that is the beginning. That the conversation, first of all, with your decision maker, and then about what do you want? So a doula can help do some of the hypothetical situations. Say you're in a car crash and um, you have severe head injuries. Would you want to be on life support for how long? Um, you know, would you want to be resuscitated if it required you to have a breathing tube in your throat? And a lot of what I think we need to do is more time frames. Instead of saying, yes, put me on life support, as if that's a forever thing, life support should be a bridge to wellness. When it's a bridge to nowhere, we are just um, sustaining or preventing the inevitable. Some people need that time to grieve and to realize what's happening. But again, the person on the vent on life support is the one suffering. So um, death doulas, our goal is to really have these conversations ahead of time so that people are not being forced to make decisions in the middle of crisis, which is the worst time to be making those kinds of decisions. Okay. And so both of you, I'd like to ask, what kind of resources are available? Um, are there to, for for dealing with this kind of trauma? Billy, share with us some some of your information about alternative so sources or resources for dealing with trauma. Mary Kay, and you two jump in. Yeah. Um, well, um, resources here for us are, are really mostly provided by hospice agencies um, in their. Um, providing sort of a liaison between um, the doctor, the family, the patient. Um, we don't have even inpatient hospice facilities okay. in the community. So this is mostly being done in the home. We have a few support groups in my area, um, you know, for dying people, but in, in their families, we don't have a whole lot of resources in our community, to be honest, for people who are dying in their families. So I'm excited to say that um, the time is coming, Billy, at least here in Iowa, we have 14 certified death doulas who are ready and willing to help. And I actually just met with uh, two of our funeral directors to start to get the word out. We have a website, it's communitydeathdoulas.org, where you can go and look at the profile of these death doulas and then contact them should you want their help. But I think the key is gonna be working with hospices. Hospices, as you know, many are for profit now. And so a nurse's caseload is much higher than it used to be. So they are not able to stay during um, a dying vigil or um, come, I mean, they will come in the middle of the night if there's a crisis. But I really feel like we as death doulas can help fill in the gaps. There are many resources. One is AARP's um, checklist for my family. 
Um, everyone knows AARP. So they are starting to create workbooks that anyone can order. I think this was $15. And then the book you mentioned, um, Billy, this living, fully dying well, dying prepared. And then one that I'd like to recommend, B.J. Miller is a palliative care doctor and just came out with this, A Beginner's Guide to the End. And the reason I like BJ, you can find him on YouTube. He's got a great TED talk. Um, BJ and his wife, um, from his own brush with death, he was um, on a streetcar and grabbed the um, electric wiring and was seriously electrocuted, lost both his legs and part of an arm. And so that changed his trajectory as becoming a physician to choose palliative care for the very reason we're talking about, to help people know what they would want at the end of life. So um, look for death doulas, we're coming. <laughs> and um, specifically, I, if I can dial in there, just talking about people learning to manage that trauma. Um, Michael Pollan has written a book called How to Change Your Mind in that he talks about the use of psychedelics, which is, you know, controversial, just being researched. Um, and he specifically speaks of a man who was terrified of dying, terrified, terrified, terrified. And he underwent some, he took the suggestion to undergo some ke ke ketamine therapy. And there are lots of modalities out there. Um, and he was not afraid of dying. But he didn't want to die, but he was not afraid to die. And he, his, you know, his perspective changed completely. Um, speak to that alternative psychedelics, whatever, you know, whatever your thoughts are about how that might be something that's uh, uh, we'll be we'll be looking at soon. Um, it's kind of an open ended question. Anyone who wants to jump in. Yeah, I have some experience um, there as well. Um, with my own psychedelic experience and it changing my own perspective of death in a beautiful, spiritual, helpful manner. Um, I would love to see that um, be a means of support for people who are experiencing the trauma of grieving um, in conjunction with things to support it, of course. Um, it, it, it really has been um, very powerful for changing um, one's perspective on death itself for me personally. Um, wasn't fearing it before, but definite change perspective. Um, and that's being researched more and more as well and becoming more and more accepted as well. So if we could really marry the two, that would be a beautiful um, thing for the future in helping people transition and cope. Thank you. Yeah, and I think what I would add to that is when I first, oh my gosh, I was a hospice volunteer back in the late 70s, early 80s. That's how old I am. And we really only had morphine and Ativan, which are great drugs. But now we have so many more drugs um, that can help with end of life pain and suffering. So I now say no one should suffer at end of life. No one. Um, I, there are those aberrations, you know, those one in a thousand cases where um, we've had to go to conscious sedation, or now we call it respite sedation. And that's taking away the awareness of what a person is going through for a time, and then lifting the sedation to see if that um, suffering has abated. So that, even just telling people that that's an option has often helped to alleviate their fear of suffering. Because I think that's what most people fear. They, um, having different ideas about afterlife can help. Um, but I would say what people most fear when I've been at the bedside it's that it's going to be awful. The pain and the suffering is what um, most of them fear. So thankfully we're at a time where we have pharmacists who are now on hospice teams. I know our palliative care team had pharmacists who come to the bedside and a combination of spiritual care, 
and then pharmacologic care. And of course, the other supportive, we, we had a music therapist and boy, what she could do with music therapy, um, especially around legacy, she would uh, record songs for loved ones um, and sometimes change the lyrics to make it particularly meaningful. So um, I just think we are doing so much better with end of life care. And that word needs to get out as well so that people can understand it's not something to avoid and fear at all costs. And, and speaking of educate, oh, sorry, go ahead. Bidley, Bidley. Yeah, I, I agree. We're, we are doing so much better with end of life yeah. care and that message needs to, to get out. Um, Long-term care is stigmatized where I live almost. Um, we're not mm -hmm. particularly great at it in our state. It's We're, we're typically ranked at the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. And 20 years ago, uh, in, in long-term care, hospice wasn't allowed. Oh, my God. not allow hospice in long-term care until about 15 years ago here. So that's, that's made a tremendous difference. And it is getting better. Uh, facilities or training their staff on providing good long-term care, which which wasn't done in the past, and it's being required in in some places. And I think it's a really good a good message that um, that that's kind of a resource for us here. That's where you get help taking care of people when they're dying is in these facilities. And there's a lack of trust, but there is some mm. improvement happening. Okay. And so picking up on the whole the whole uh, idea of offering options for people, you know, in, one of the things that I've heard recently is, you know, instead of burial in a casket, which is ecologically unsound, there are people, and I know there's a woman in Iowa City who is trying to develop a green burial um, program and water cremations. So there are options that we need to learn to share with other people. So go ahead and speak on that or about that. So in my um, death plan, I have said cremation unless green burial is available. So um, right now, as, as Beth said, we uh, have a group that are working on with a local um, uh, funeral home, getting the land, and then you have to get the land designated in a specific way. So it's quite a long process, but I'm very hopeful that I'll have a green burial. Um, which is truly returning to the soil instead of being, you know, using horrible amounts of energy to make us into something that is not even biological anymore. So yes, green burial is definitely an option. Um, and I guess what I want to say in all of this conversation, what keeps coming to me is the word dignity dignity throughout rather than fear that we can now provide dignity. And I even think the burial, you know, the whole um, having to, you know, put somebody in a box. I mean, our ideas are being changed. We need to respect the earth. We need to respect our bodies. So thankfully, we're entering into a time where I think dignity is really leading our care and our end of life practices. Um, you had when, uh, you know, before, as we were prepping, both of you were talking a little bit about medical aid and dying. For people oh. who are not familiar with that concept, can you enlighten us and tell us a little bit about what's involved, medical aid and dying? Billy, you want to do that as the nurse? Sure. My understanding um, currently is that it is limit. It is available in a limited amount of states, and requires you to require to maintain or have established residency there, as well as having a um, diagnosis that um, the end of your life is um, looks like it might be six months or so so out. And in those situations, if those criteria are met, a physician can prescribe to you um, something that you can take at your own discretion and will that will allow you to in your life, um, in your home with your loved ones. Yeah. Yeah. Brittany Maynard was kind of the big uh, young person who made this um, 
hit the news. As you remember, she was dying of some kind of cancer and was adamant that it be at her, um, her dictation, when she died, how she died. And that really has brought to the forefront the whole medically, uh, a medical aid in dying um, issue. It is not available here in Iowa. Um, and as you said earlier, Billy, there are some states that will really fight this. It's been a change in attitude for me um, because I have been very much of the philosophy that we shouldn't cross that line. But I will tell you, I have seen horrific, painful, awful deaths um, that have really made me rethink how I feel about this issue. Um, the other issue that I think is coming more quickly is the voluntary stop eating and drinking. Um, and that is something that um, I think hospices are embracing because it's, it's very similar to what happens in the end of life for a, a person anyways. We all stop eating and drinking um, towards the end of life as our energy fades, as we sleep more. It's a very natural process. So these are topics that are um, coming, um, but I've not had to deal with any of them yet. So as we kind of come to a close here, we've got a couple of minutes. I'd like to ask each of you to, again, reiterate what resources you think people might um, might look to and what would you like our viewers to take from this conversation? So to reiterate some resources, um, it's often hospice caseworkers. Um, it's often hospice chaplains. AARP has resources and there are several workbooks available to help one work through this process. Um, I think the final message is that we need to get some more education out there so that we can get more done legislatively so that people do have more rights, options, and choices to follow out any plan that they may feel is best for them um, so that they can go with the dignity that they deserve. Mm. Mary Kay, and, quickly. You know, we're in the middle of the holidays right now, and I just would really challenge you to have the conversation. Um, there are card games that give you questions to be asking family members, but really to just try to risk having that conversation, um, typically it can be very rewarding and it will really save you in a time of crisis to at least know, mom always said she never wanted this. Um, sometimes using family or friends who bad things have happened to, well, you know, Uncle Bob this, I never want that to happen to me. So I, the takeaway I hope you have is to have the conversation. And if you're really brave to, get an advanced directive completed. And so I'm just gonna um, close up here at the beginning of the conversation, I mentioned my terminally ill mother and a specific example, had I known then what I know now, things would have been different. I thought we should go to the gym and I thought we should work out. What I know now is she went with me to accommodate me, but she really didn't want to. It was my uh, agenda, not hers. So um, I wanna thank our panel analysts and just invite our listeners to explore any of these topics and we're here to help you. Thank you.